Dear friends, it's always a pleasure to be here in Helsinki University. Uh, almost my alma mater because I, I was <laughs> elected the doctor of honors causa of this university and that was a very, very big event in my life. Uh, and especially pleasant is to be here today and I am very thankful for your invitation uh, to meet all these people who are making this kind of very unique, very important work of research uh, devoted to developments uh, in Russia and on the Russian and Finnish, Baltic and other neighbors, say, bridge. Finland have been really very active and very successful in keeping this bridge open, even in times when it was quite difficult. Uh, for us in Estonia during Soviet time, Finland was really the only window open to the, the West. That is one of paradoxes of our lives, that Finland have himself also believed that they are in the West compared to Estonia. Only when we looked at the map, we understand that Finland is in the North and we are in the South. Uh, and uh, happily now, today, we are together in the West. Uh, but we, we have not to forget that uh, that is really uh, the result of very, very strong efforts uh, to remain in Finland, to be built up again in Estonia, uh, the democratic, independent states. And this conference today uh, has a very symbolic time frame. Uh, Estonia and many other countries in this side of Europe are celebrating really the rebirth or birth of independent nation states from the fires, turmoils and catastrophes of the First World War and as aftermath of Russian Revolution. And uh, this celebration, in this sense, has uh, its very painful background. Uh, but uh, this start, if it is a start for Finland, it's a bit earlier than for Estonia, the start of this road to democracy. We know it was interrupted. Uh, in 20th century by the other catastrophe, the Second World War, but before that, the replacement of this dreamland of democracy and freedom and humanism in Europe by two awful totalitarian regimes, Nazi Germany and Bolshevik Russia. And I think that what we are doing here with you today is to try to draw lessons, to understand the lessons of history. And for that, 68 is really a very special year. Uh, it is a special year not only because there were certain events and movements. It's a special year also from the viewpoint of understanding and learning. And learning, for example, that the same things, the same events, even the same numbers, could be absolutely differently interpreted, understood and remembered from different sides of Europe. Europe in this time of 68 was divided. It was divided by the Iron Curtain. And this Iron Curtain was a very thick and very cruel barrier between our part of Europe, our mean now those who were under so-called socialist camp, and the other part of Europe, which was on the other side in so-called free world. 
And fortunately for Finland, Finland was on the side of freedom. We were on the side of real, let's say, political slavery, let's tell it like that. And in this western side of Europe and in the world, 68 really celebrated as uh, the time of the youth revolution. The youth awakening, the students taking over, students taking over the streets, students taking over the cities, students really showing that new generation born in the war, after war, have grown up and want to take over the world following new values, looking for new ideals, having new dreams, not dreams of more and more consuming more and more goods, not dreams of having better cars, not dreams of more and more entertainment, but dreams of becoming better people, dreams of love between people, dreams of equality between nations, dreams of freedom from everybody in the world. This celebration of love, the celebration of spiritual freedom, even if it later on faded away and showed its weaknesses and maybe also some uglier sides, it has remained in our memories as a call, call for brighter, brighter future, brighter, brighter humanity. We very often speak about generation of 68. But when I meet with people from West, then West, then they are always surprised when they understand that the 68 meant a bit different thing for people in the East. Not only in Prague, because everybody is speaking about Prague. But Prague, it was a symbol. Prague, it was a, the really the, the hotspot. Prague was a place where this, say, explosion happened. But in all other countries of this socialist camp. This explosion also was not only felt, but also there were own explosions, own movements. And here, for example, in Estonia, in my university city, Tartu, we also had, we had strong student movements, we had clashes with KGB, we had hopes that so-called Czech spring will become also Baltic spring. And Generation of 68, we then being students, we also retained these dreams, these hopes for the future. And I dare to say that what happened in Europe in 88, 89 really was prolongation. It was really very much creation of this generation of 68. The continuation of this unfinished project, like Habermas is calling it. And now, in 2018, we have to look and evaluate the successes, failures, undoings, and still unaccomplished tasks of this project. I think it's very important to, to do it. It's very important to discuss those things also here on this conference. It's very, very important conference. And it's important conference, especially because it's, like I said, it's conference uniting people with different experiences from the Eastern and Western side of the border. But may I make uh, some hint or, or say a word of mild warning. Uh, when I was looking at the uh, book of this program and uh, these uh, short descriptions, uh, then certainly they are not reflecting everything which will be discussed and then told. But uh, I had some feeling that uh, we have to make a bit more conscious effort 
to find a new language, uh, to find more comprehensive, maybe more, more sensitive language to describe, analyze, and understand what is going on in this Europe after, after 68, after 89, after 2014, where these previous prisoners of socialist camp were acquired, accepted membership in EU. What is going on now? What is going on with Brexit? What is going on in Europe between Trump, Putin, and Erdogan? It's too easy to use this clear, visible mapping east-west. But it's not working if you look at Trump, what it has to do with east and west. It's something else. It is also quite easy to say, oh, we know that's old nationalism, this old nationalism is already again rising ahead and, and it is dangerous. But we have to look that in countries like Finland, by the way, national feelings haven't brought destruction, but creation of the prosperous, open, democratic, friendly, educated country. Being not only close friends, but we consider ourselves to be the family members with Finns in the bigger family. We, we, we are very proud having this, not only neighbor, but a brother or sister, I don't know, because our languages don't make difference between genders, you know? <laughs> and also in Estonia, in many other countries, we can also see that the so-called national part of our consciousness, of our values, could be open and creative, not only destructive and ugly. So what is, what is making this difference? Why it is different in different countries? And when now it was mentioned that uh, the idea of liberal democracy, uh, this dream that now liberal democracy will be overwhelming everywhere, meaning for everybody freedom, for everybody human rights, for everybody real, the dignity of, of, of every person in the world, have now showing its weakness and is severely attacked by the forces, what I will call maybe new authoritarianism. Why these forces are becoming so popular? Why not, not in so-called Eastern Europe? In Eastern Europe, by the way, if you take look at new members of EU, then only in two of them you see that these forces have been winning. But even look at Sweden, what happened on Swedish elections. Look at Germany. Being in the European Parliament, I have been listening on every plenary Marie Le Pen. And you can only imagine what happened with France if Marie Le Pen will, will win elections. So what it is? What is going on? What they have neglected? In our rhetoric, in our practices, in our politics. And I think we have to be very critical. We have to be wise and we have to be quick. Why quick? Because it's big time pressure. It's shortage of time to understand what is going on. Because there are new forms of totalitarian regime, new digital totalitarianism already on the horizon. Look at the use of new possibilities of algorithmization, of manipulation, used by Russia, but by some others also. Look at the China emerging as a new power, liberated from poverty and, and having own dreams, but already applying its digital developments to control 
the everyday lives of the people, with the depths and strengths unimaginable even in these industrial old European totalitarian regimes. Being in European Parliament, what we <coughs> there had was really already everyday fight between these people, politicians from Europe, East and West, the same, who see the human rights and democracy as a main value of Europe, which we have to protect in this world, that to protect, to cherish, and to, how to say, to arm, to arm philosophically, scientifically, technologically, to be capable to stand this pressure from this new totalitarian movement. And what was the opposition? Opposition, it wasn't so much these visible forces of this new authoritarianism. The worst, the worst really threat and danger was, or was coming from these forces, politicians, who said, oh, don't worry, that's business as usual. It's a business model. It has nothing to do with any kind of democracy, non-democracy. What is human rights? Human rights, you know, it's a last utopia. We have to forget about human rights. What they're talking, it's something from the past. It's 19th century. It's philosophy. Who wants philosophy nowadays? We want technology. And I suppose that here and elsewhere, when we discuss lessons of history, we are capable today not only look at that as something, say, like humanitarian hobby, but we have to understand that namely from this knowledge, from those lessons, we can get the strengths to withstand to this new authoritarianism and new totalitarian tendencies in the contemporary world. And Finland, I will say, I hope together with Estonia, is one of the best places to think about those things. With our experience, with our smallness, which allows us to look at the world in the, I will say, with sufficient uh, humbleness, but at the same time with uh, high spiritual ambitions. So I wish you high spiritual ambitions. I wish you success in this conference, and I wish Alexander Institute to go on with more and more broadening its views and its influence in the spiritual area in Europe. Thank you.